<laughs> in case this doesn't work, we I go wanna, down in flames. Well, I want to. I'm going to because I, I may hand you some things here as we're. So I think I'm going to get just a bit closer to get comfortable with that, Stacy. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm still out of your shot on it. Okay. Can you? How is that for you for that wide shot? Is that going to? Um, you want me in a little closer when you want to do that? Yeah. Do you want my code buttoned or not? Um, actually. Button. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Right why don't you pull back and see what your two shot looks like? Yeah, I probably can get in a little closer and still. Uh, can you get by that okay? Mm -hmm. Just so I don't start waving my hands around getting in your shot. Yeah, we got Let's see what your head and shoulders looks like, Stacy. Oh, you've got some, though. Yeah, I'm looking at a monitor here. Yeah, Stacy, I, <laughs> I was so important in my station. I was telling Grant once there was a flood. And my job was to hold the boat by the phone booth so the reporter could call back. I had to jump out of the boat all the time. Every time we got to a phone booth. <laughs> You're going to hear some real stories, Stacy. I can't. I hope I remember to ask about them. Okay. okay. Well, I think we're ready to go. So roll your tape and. Uh, One before you start, you know the thing that I thought was really odd about our weather setup at KW was that the weather stuff was in the basement. And the set was upstairs. Yeah. So you never really knew what was going on with the weather when you were on air, well, which is just so foreign to what it has to be nowadays. But again, that's the you know there wasn't much thought given to uh, to the relationship between the content and the presentation. Then you know the weather uh, the weather room in uh, Channel Two was uh, again <coughs> well it was a. <coughs> It wasn't a room that had a window, so you could, Conrad could look outside, but it was uh, certainly uh, 25 yards from, from the studio. I mean, it was not, and it was in a little boxy room. It had a, and all it had in it was a teletype, and that, of course, had, and they had a radar at uh, WMT. Which Do you know was, Conrad came to visit me once in Columbus? Did he? Yeah, That's when he was on his way to wherever he was retiring to, Florida. the whole back of his vehicle was nothing but tools. Yeah, <laughs> right. And he did that until the day he died. Yeah. You and know, he was the, my inspiration. I know that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, you know, you know the story. He hit a dog with his bicycle. No. Yeah. He's dead. He's oh, he's gone. I didn't know he that. He didn't know that. Uh -uh. It's been about two years. You know, he was, uh, you know, very active, and he and his wife traveled around in that motor home, and uh, he rode a bike uh, for exercise, and he was out riding his bike. <coughs> he either hit the dog or was trying to avoid it, and went over the handlebars and hit his head, and and that was the end. Of course, I didn't know that one. Well, I'm glad, I'm, yeah, I, I'm glad I mentioned it, because we'll, you know, at some point we'll talk about Conrad. Okay. Yeah, but he's, but that was about two years ago this time. Odd. Yeah. And, and again, he was very vigorous. I mean, we've got his interview. I have an interview with him in that oh, file great. over there. Yeah. He was one of the ones who <laughs> we targeted. You know, but I had to catch him while he was up here because they spent, well, they're, they, um, they sort of headquartered in Florida and, uh, uh, and then traveled around the country in the summertime. Okay, are you rolling, Stacy? Yeah. This will probably be just like a conversation. It will be a conversation. <laughs> it will. So. But I want to get a formal start on <laughs> okay. it so we know where they're. Ready, go. Okay, this is the Broadcasting History interview, which we're doing on August 12th, 2005. And my guest is a very dear former colleague of mine, uh, Jim Ganahl from Channel 7 in uh, Waterloo, Iowa. At KWWL TV, where he began right. his career, uh, who is uh, now the weather god in Columbus, Ohio, at uh, WCMH TV, yeah. right? The, the NBC O and O station in Columbus. Yeah. And uh, you've been at that station f uh, for for a lot of years. Yeah. Twenty-seven years. Twenty-seven years. It's a long time. It is more than I was on TV here in Iowa, actually. But, but the roots are here, of course. Of course. Well, several times more, actually. But yes. So we um, we want to go back uh, to the beginning for uh, for your story, uh, but uh, to kind of put you where you are now, you you still do uh, you do six and ten weather, uh, five 
five thirty, six, and eleven o'clock weather broadcast, uh, five days a week. And I'm also part of NBC's new digital Weather Plus network, mm -hmm. where we do tapings for weather broadcasts in the afternoons, evenings, and overnights as well. So on it's new, still on the primarily digital channels. Mm -hmm. So this is the 21st century world where uh, television stations are starting to send out up to five, six signals at a time. Unfortunately, I don't have to know anything about that. <laughs> I just know only about weather. You know you're supposed to put weather on <laughs> yeah. one of them. Well, that's, that's right. That's terrific. Well, <clears throat> again, uh, back to Waterloo now and the Ganahl family, which certainly has a very distinguished history in many ways. Uh, uh, but uh, the Ganahl children, uh, t talk about your mom and dad. Uh, I don't remember their names. My name. mom and dad mm -hmm. uh, were from Dubuque, Iowa, originally. Mm -hmm. And we traveled around eastern Iowa, Clinton, Cedar Rapids. I was born in Cedar Rapids, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. And uh, Burlington and ended up in Waterloo about the time we were in middle school. And um, as we got older, we were kind of thinking of what we wanted to do for our first jobs. Mm -hmm. And in Waterloo, there was basically three things. You could work at Rath Packing Company. <laughs> you could work at John Deere <laughs> Tractor Works. <laughs> or the TV station. Yeah. So we're not stupid. We thought that was the easy way out. Uh -huh. So all of us went into TV uh -huh. at KWWL. And all of us being, uh, well, go your, uh, your brothers? I started first, yeah. um, just before I started college. Hmm. I was 17 years old. Hmm. And um, got a couple funny stories. We'll go on that, about that afterward. But uh, then Jeff came, and Jeff was a, a photographer. Mm -hmm. and he stayed there probably about as long as I did, 10, 12 years. Not quite as long. He moved. He made his move to the Twin Cities. Right. Uh, and he's still at KSTP. And still there. And my brother John went through the department that had like directing and the audio and production. Became the and, production director. And he's now a general manager mm -hmm. of a TV station in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. <laughs> my brother Joe, the last one, was a sportscaster, and he moved out to Casper, Wyoming. And he's no longer in broadcasting. He's a pastor of a church now. I see. But um, And you had a sister who did some broadcasting? Did some radio. Jackie did some radio mm -hmm. in Dubuque, mm -hmm. Iowa. Mm -hmm. And so almost all of us went into broadcasting. And it was kind of unusual because we never had any training that way. <laughs> and certainly you didn't get that through high school. Right. And broadcasting, communications, and journalism mm -hmm. wasn't much in college beyond mm -hmm. speech classes. Right. Well, um, so you referred to the fact uh, well, that you were uh, you began your career when you were 17. Remember this guy? <laughs> yeah, I'm out of the shame. <laughs> now I'm 40 <laughs> years older and 100 pounds heavier, but you got the soft lens on today, don't you? <laughs> well, so, anyway, uh, oh my that gosh. would be uh, not right at the beginning, but that's yours, Jim, if you want to just uh, drop it by that's the... That's pretty close, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty close to the beginning, I would guess. You were... That probably was... Uh, that was the longest my hair ever was, and that wasn't really considered long back in the hippie area, era. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good likeness of you. Well, so let's get into the story of how that happened. Um, so you're you're a high you're you're probably were senior in high school then. Yeah. What happened was, mm. I had a difficult time finding anything I really liked in school mm -hmm. as a kid. Never did very well grade wise, and then I started watching uh, Conrad Johnson on WMT for weather, mainly because I got upset with the people at Waterloo because they would miss the forecast for snow days. And I expected a snow day to get me out of school and we would have to go. So I started paying attention to what uh, Conrad Johnson was talking about back then when I was in middle school. And that became my total focus from that point on. And so, yeah, oh, he, his maps to me spoke so much more than actually is on here with just a few lines because he showed you the wind direction, he showed you the fronts, putting them on with and, and he showed where the precipitation was going to fall in the hatchet areas like nobody else ever did at that time because there was not available to us satellite or radar or anything and I found his work just fascinating and so I modeled everything that I did on TV after his approach, his demeanor, and I had walked into KWWL one time because I'd gotten fed up <laughs> with these bad forecasts. And I don't know why, because I was never a brash or cocky person. But I walked in and said, I can do the job better than the guy you got doing it. And they said, OK, you can do that. But the who <clears> was <throat> it? But it's very important as to who you told that to. It was a guy named Jim Bradley, wasn't it? That's right. 
the southern gentleman. Yep. <laughs> and you certainly had to be pretty persuasive as a 17-year-old to say, I can do better. I, I know it wasn't hard. But, but that was the only thing I, I can remember saying in that conversation. And so he just said, uh, well, the guy that we had just quit. Mm -hmm. So, okay. It was kind of a novel approach to put somebody on who was 17. And I was a local person for Waterloo. WMT dominated the market. So I thought, well, we'll probably put some local flavor on here and see if uh, that it could make a difference. And we right. had Stan Sheriff, who was the uh, football coach and athletic director at UNI, yes. do sports. But the guy didn't know anything about sports. <laughs> I mean, I can still remember to this day. He goes, Carl Yastrzewski for Carl Yastrzemski. <laughs> Veda Paisan for Veda Pinson. He just in other butchered words, in other every word, name. Sheriff, Sheriff didn't know anything about anything. He didn't know anything. So I looked good by comparison. <laughs> he, was, he was a great coach and athletic director. <laughs> he was. So I looked really so, good next to him. So Sheriff was on with you doing sports when mm -hmm. you started doing weather. That's right. <laughs> and couldn't pronounce. Anything <laughs> other than football stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, here come the stories. But uh, so Jim Ganahl gets on the set with uh, Stan Sheriff, you remember who was anchoring then? Um, I thought it was Tom Peterson even at that point, but I'm not sure. It may have been. I, I wouldn't. I it think may, that it was. It may have been. Anyway. And then Mike O'Connor came right after Stan okay. Sheriff. Okay, so O'Connor replaced Sheriff. And then. John Emmert was his backup. Okay, so the prob probability is that Peterson was there when you made your debut on uh, Channel 7 doing weather. And on the second show, so you came darn close to getting fired. And you know Jim Bradley. He's I like know six Jim foot Bradley. Ten, <laughs> and I was five foot four at the time, mm -hmm. and 140 some pounds. And one of these lights, these hot lights, blew up and rained what appeared to me to be hot flaming glass. And you can down say on. that word on this television. I can't. You bet. Right. So it rains this hot flaming glass down on me while I'm doing the weather, and this is only my second time on TV. I was nervous enough. And so I said, oh, shit, right on air, <laughs> back when you couldn't do that. And he says, if you ever do that again, you'll never be on this TV. This is Bradley. <laughs> Bradley. <laughs> After the second mm -hmm. broadcast. But <laughs> as hot as it got with Bradley, he tended to cool off after 24 hours or so. And I had a great relationship with him. He was wonderful. He was a cre very creative man. And he had some instinct when this 17-year-old kid walked in there and said, I think I can do it better than your guy can. I was telling you, I didn't even have a car yet at the time. <laughs> yeah. And after the 10 o'clock news, I had to walk home, and I was scared of dogs. Mm. And so I went to uh, the Dairy Cattle Congress in town and purchased a bullwhip. <laughs> so I'm walking down the street every night at 1030. They must have wa wanted to arrest me with a bullwhip, whacking trees and things like that. But I'm a guy who knows what a bullwhip is really supposed to do, Jim. <laughs> and it has a cracker on the end of it. So if you learn to flip it a certain way, it would make it sound it like great. a gun. Right? It was great. I was pretty good at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's got to be an absolutely unique story in broadcasting history. The weatherman walks home with a bullwhip. Because my dad was always in the bowling alley or home with the other five kids. Yeah. So I had to fed pretty much for you, myself. You didn't care for dogs. Not at that time, no. <laughs> okay. Well, then, let me hand you one more picture here because this is, uh, so this is where, this is several years later, but you wind up with a lot of respectability for what you're doing and uh, with, a gr with a team that really started to pull KWWL into its own. And I think a lot of this was incorporating uh, the, the viewership as well, too, like, on these maps that we had here, which were just a few magnetic numbers, one of the most important things that we did, it seemed like at the time, was we had a pointer to point at these maps yeah. rather than our hands. Well, people from all over eastern Iowa would send us different pointers. I'd have pointers made out of fish poles. I'd have pointers made out of umbrellas. And so we would use all these different pointers from all these people every single night. And it was really kind of cool at the time because the map certainly wasn't much to right. show off, but the pointers were. But the pointer era would have been a little, uh, a little ahead of this set. That would have been, but again, it was. Oh no, I don't think it was <laughs> because we had two walls there, and so we okay. just pulled back and forth and point on these maps. Right. Anyway, <laughs> but that it, so it turned into a little bit of a, a little bit of a shtick, a little gimmick. But it, but but again, it was showing how the audience was. Uh, 
was connecting with what you were doing. And we had the Super Shooters basketball team as yeah. well. Yeah. Tom and Mike played on that, and yeah. Dale Hansen was the farm director. He was about 6'5 six, or 6'6 six, six at the time. Yeah. And we would go around every weekend to a small community and play their Lions Club or their Girl Scouts or something in a basketball game for <laughs> their whatever their charity was. And we did that 13 to 14 weekends uh, every single winter, and it was great because these gyms would be packed everywhere we went. Channel 7 was making a notch in, <laughs> in Channel 2's <laughs> belt. I it? don't know why, but maybe it was because we were just, um, uh, Channel 2 we viewed as being more pure news. We kind of added a little bit more personality, which, uh, just a little bit though, because no. I'm on your side on all of this and don't feel we are personalities or celebrities. We basically have to be very professional about what we do, and maybe they liked us because they realized, well, he knows what he's talking about. But we still did that with a little bit of uh, pizzazz, maybe. Well, in a little bit of pizzazz, but there were also there is such a thing as chemistry in television. Exactly. And you and Peterson and O'Connor certainly had it. And when Ron Steele and came, Ron, it continued. You're right. And when you left, it continued with. Uh, eventually with Craig Johnson, who was Conrad's successor. I can remember um, right. I had never wanted to actually leave uh, Waterloo. And I went to high school with Bill Bolster, uh -huh. who was the general manager at yeah. that time. And he went on to a big career in NBC as well. He certainly did. But uh, I was sitting in his living room on the floor with him, and we were discussing, uh, I have this offer to come to Ohio. And, um, and would they pay me two or 3000 more to stay? And it was like double my salary to come out here. And so they couldn't, and so I left. And the reason I got the job there was because their weatherman was not able to get into work for a week because he didn't know a blizzard was coming. So we didn't have any credibility for weather because he couldn't even get to work. And so they said to me when I got there, you're always going to get to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the key to getting that job. Amazing, amazing. Well, <clears throat> just one more. There's, um, th that's the uh, the set that was in use at the time. Uh, Man, you, uh, how could we wear those suits? Well, there's on some a of those camera. jackets kind of jump out, don't they? Yeah, but they got a shimmy all the time at home. <laughs> they had to make people sick. We had a lot of things to learn, Jim. As we learned learned everything the hard way. And we I, never used makeup at that time, no, ever. No. And it never dawned mm -hmm. on us that you had to use makeup on TV. Well, there's another picture of the trio. Uh, in, it's a, the one color one that we have. I was really surprised when Ron Steele went from sports over to the news desk, but obviously it's worked real well for him. Well, it was a big, it was a big gamble. There was a lot of front office debate about that when we uh, Ron applied for the position, and we were one of the first stations and one of the few stations that ever did make a successful uh, transplant of a sports guy into a news anchor chair. Wow. And Ron had the motivation to do it, and uh, certainly, but again, you, the chemistry carried right over there. Peterson, Ganahl, and Steele were a natural combination, right? I know, we never had to rehearse anything that anybody said at any time. It was just natural. That's exactly. who you were. That's who you were. I think that's the important thing. And right. people, for some reason, I don't understand it from this side of the camera to the other side, but they understand if you're being conversational and being sincere and if honest. You're being yourself. Yeah. If you aren't, it's detectable. It is. It's amazing because you wouldn't think because you're a professional actor in one sense, but still it's enough of a difference that it would come through. But I think your philosophy on it is a key to it. You be yourself. And you, <laughs> you think of yourself as being weather because that's how you think of yourself. And Steele thinks of himself as news. And uh, that's why it works. Yeah, we even dream weather dreams. <laughs> Isn't that sad? <laughs> the guy I work with, we've been together 25 years, will come in and say, I had a snow dream last night, but it melted before I woke up. <laughs> I mean, we just dream weather too. So. Well, uh, the tools that you had, uh, Jim, in uh, the all that you had in there was the weather wire. Exactly. Uh, by that, that was the the NOAA weather wire. It was the wire that that pumped out at 60 words a minute, 
what statistical information you could use to create a forecast. I know. It was terrible because it would say at 1 p.m. a front is located from Minneapolis to Omaha mm -hmm. at 1 p.m. Well, that's all we would know about that front because we didn't have satellite, we didn't have radar, and so it was basically uh, learning to read the clouds for signs and learning to understand sea patterns over and over again and commit it to memory so that you recognize things that would happen. But still, even with that, I think the biggest so change came uh, on May 15, 1968, because then all of a sudden weather on TV was no longer the same because we had the tornadoes that hit Charles City and Olwine yeah. at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And we really did not have any idea so it was those no were happening. Right. You know what I was doing that afternoon, <coughs> just waiting for the news to come on at 6? <coughs> I was just watching WMT's cartoons, sitting there just watching <coughs> that when that happened. And then after that, of course, look at where we've gone. Uh, weather offices have their own Doppler radar. We have controls over those things. We have the weather wires right where we broadcast from, so we never leave that room. We can go on the air ourselves, use, uh, punch up our own cameras, and we have the computer graphics to create everything. So we're now totally self-contained mm -hmm. and, um, and totally aware, we hope, of everything before it happens. But you were, and again, you started doing this as a 17-year-old. That weather wire did, they created a forecast for Iowa, and then I think they were creating a Northeast Iowa forecast at that mm -hmm. time, weren't they? Yeah. So you adapted that with what little additional information you had to create the forecast that you gave the viewers in, uh, in Northeast Iowa on yeah, Channel 7. Yeah, I missed, remember one month we missed a forecast 18 times. <laughs> well. I'm surprised I'm still working, aren't you? <laughs> well. I mean, there weren't very many days you got it right that month. But uh, after a while, uh, we started to have a little better feel for it and add more things with the Alden machines, which printed out satellites. And well, and again, Ooh. after you, but, but it was after you left that we put in the... Uh, on the um, uh, facsimile machine. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's uh, right, <laughs> in gratitude. <laughs> but, uh, but that was the, uh, that was, so when Craig came into it, uh, there were a couple people in between, but Craig really was your successor at Channel 7. And Terry Swales and was Terry there. Terry Swales while. was there. Great he, basketball player on our basketball he team. He was, by the way. he was weekend <laughs> at the time. And then he, uh, but then Terry uh, made a decision to move on to Dubuque, and then that's when Craig came in there. Yeah, I think he's at Davenport right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's taken me, I was thinking about this, we were talking, this is my 40th year in broadcasting. It probably took us 30-some years to develop the weather office the way we think it should be mm -hmm. as far as functional and be able to be useful. And your management has been visionary enough to do that. <laughs> I think you kind of have to be or else you lose the game. Mm -hmm. Because weather is still very important. Number one in <laughs> most markets, I would suspect, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. far as importance. Mm -hmm. Well, let's stay in Waterloo for the for the time being. You, uh, uh, so you're watching cartoons on Channel Two when the when the uh, old wine tornado hit. Yeah, and then during the night after that, I went with Dean Prime, and we were up covering all of this. I mean, I wasn't doing any of the covering; the reporters were doing it. I was just there, basically observing, helping, and being a helper. Right. And they did, they never used me as a talent on the field like that. There wasn't any way to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I guess not. But also, you could have taped some of it, I yeah. suppose, but we well, never did. Have, but it would have had to be on film <laughs> because uh, they were shooting film. They weren't shooting tape. This so, is 68. Oh, my gosh. <coughs> so anyhow, I come back after, after spending the whole night out there covering the tornadoes. Just, to, just not to uh, go into the detail on it, but that tornado hit the southwestern edge of Old Wine and just went right straight across the town. <coughs> virtually wiped out the downtown uh, and went on to hit Maynard. That's correct. And uh, almost simultaneously, there was a similar storm that hit Charles That State. was the bigger one. That was an F3 probably. That's an F3. And that did really wipe out downtown Charles City. It sure did. So the media in uh, Waterloo and Cedar Rapids, where the television stations were located, were covering those cataclysmic uh, natural events with uh, with movie film that had to be hauled back to the studio and processed before you could get it on the air. The next day. The next day. 
But you were out all night with Fryne, and you remember who the shooter was? Um, it doesn't matter. But. No, unless it had been John Dodge, but I'm not sure he was there at the time. Anyway. Could have been. Uh, but you were... You were you were sort of the tag along on it, and you were the you were the weather. You got some yeah. real observation of tornado damage. You Absolutely. remember what you saw up there that night? Well, primarily also we went to all the shelters where people were coming yeah. in, and they were being fed and comforted, and and I think people liked seeing us there yeah. more than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but you had to be careful because there were lines down, and there were holes where houses used to be. You could fall in a basement very easy and not even see it. And there's yeah. of course there's no electricity. Uh, during the night at all. And Charles City was already cordoned off by either police or National, National Guard. Guard. Right. And so uh, that was very hard to get in and out of that particular right. one. And Dean Fryan uh, was doing the reporting on that. I know, but it was just amazing that that would happen and we wouldn't even know about it in advance. Right. And there was not even a clue mm. that something like that would happen. That was before the television stations started to run the weather warnings. Well, but the, but the weather service wasn't putting out warnings. I know. Isn't that amazing? Right. It doesn't seem possible nowadays that that could happen. Well, it's whether or not, I don't know if you know it or not, but the transmitter engineer uh, for KOEL O-Line saw the, their transmitter was located at the southwestern edge of uh, O-Line. Yeah, by that lake that got the water sucked out of it. Right. And, uh, he, he went outside, saw the twister coming, went in, and they had a, had a remote mic at the transmitter building, and he went on the air and said, uh, there's, a, there's a tornado coming, and uh, then, so he gave the warning on the station to the, that's why there were only two, there were only two deaths in Old Line. There were multiple deaths in Charles City. But Maybe they got 15. that warning on that station because that transmit. And then he went out. Then he left the building and jumped out in a ditch when it went over. It didn't hit the transmitter building. It took down one of the towers. That's probably a story that you didn't know. I didn't know that one. The transmitter engineer gave the tornado warning for Old Line, wow. which obviously saved maybe dozens of lives. Mm -hmm. it's, quite a, it's quite a story. That is fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, so here comes Jim Ganahl back in the morning. Uh, covered with mud from plowing around, and he's supposed to take finals at UNI. You're, That's in right. the meantime, you're also a UNI student. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was just a sophomore at the time at UNI, uh. and so I walk up to the school and go outside my classes, and they see me like this. They say, were you out all night? Uh. And they excuse me from all my finals. Uh. I say, That's the only reason I ever passed college was because they excused me because of a tornado. How ironic is that? Well, I hope, you, I hope you didn't arrange that, Mr. Gonzalez. No, no, but, but I probably would have passed it anyhow. <laughs> you, I'm sure you would have, but, but it's a, it is a, it's a, it's a good story. Oh, it's yeah. frightening. And a real story. I yeah. didn't expect that at all. Well, of course you didn't. <laughs> but uh, again, this is a, you know, you're all, you're very early on, this is about two years into it, and you're beginning to become uh, recognized by, uh, by the community so that your profs knew, here's this, Here's our weatherman, and he spent the night at the old line tornado, and that said something to them. Yeah, but I think you know me well enough that I've never, ever be, gotten cocky or conceited about it because my job was always like a hobby to me. And I just enjoyed every single day, still do, just coming to work and being able to tell people the things I know. Like I th think I fascinated you with this little bit of stuff outside about Oh, yeah, you hear that bug? When you hear that bug, it's 90 days till frost. <laughs> These simple things. Well, let's not we, let, tell them the bug now. It's a cicada. It, right. And when you first hear a cicada, <laughs> usually in July, <laughs> mark on your calendar. It's 90 days till frost, and it's exactly right every year. And you put your weather credentials behind that. Yeah, and That's the crickets can tell though. temperature. Count <laughs> the number of chirps in 14 seconds and add 40. That's the temperature Fahrenheit. It's great. <laughs> I love this, how nature and weather all came together, and that's why when I moved to Columbus, I ended up teaching 6th, 7th, and 8th grade science and math for several years. That's wonderful. Which really helps in your overall knowledge of your own profession, too. Well, and then you went on to teach uh, summer classes at a Ohio college Western. for several years, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's let, take you back to Waterloo one sure, more time. Uh, one of the if not the worst flood that ever hit Waterloo was uh, in the 1960s. I don't remember. And it was the in the middle of August, and it was mm -hmm. about a 15-inch rain. 
that was centered just north of the Gates Park Golf Course. Mm -hmm. And it came all the way down Gordon Creek. through Great Park, yes, past St. Mary's. Yep. And uh, two people died in that particular flood near St. Mary's School, and that was before they had the levee there. Right. 180 blocks were underwater. And Jim Bradley, the tallest guy we had, our general manager, was the funniest thing at the time. <laughs> He's outside in a suit with his pants rolled up above his knees, sandbagging the television station, <laughs> which is nowhere near any river till that day. <laughs> right. I mean, this and then, is about five blocks away from the river. And then to show you how important I was at the time, they sent me out with Eldon Ebert, who was the reporter. The radio reporter. But we were in a boat. Yeah. And so Eldon was driving the boat, mm -hmm. and he was also going to be the one calling <laughs> back the stories. Right. So my job was to jump out of the boat, hold it against the current next to a phone booth, wherever <laughs> we'd find it, and he'd call back in and say, we're at this intersection of the water's five feet deep, and I'm trying to hold the boat by the phone booth. <laughs> and so we would go from phone booth to phone booth just <laughs> doing that. <laughs> There weren't any two-way radios. There weren't any cell phones. I sure phones, wish there would have been. But there were phone booths, and Jim Ganahl held the boat. Yeah, I just held the boat. I, your, your stories are incredible, <laughs> Mr. Ganahl. Surprised I didn't get tetanus. <laughs> but, um, again, a terrible flood. Oh, it was awful. Hmm. And then they built that. And also at the time, hmm. I don't know if you knew this, hmm. I was working for the city engineering department hmm. uh, during the early part of the days before I came over to KW. And so we were in on the design huh. of that levee down 63, Hudson, was it Hudson Road, or the one that goes down to Hudson. Well, so that's the, that was the Black Hawk, Black Hawk, Black Creek. Hawk Creek. I was to help design that but levee. Well, you did. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, they, they were working on then, of mm -hmm. course, the... Um, well, then the eventually, of course, that, uh, that experience and then the, the later floods in Dubuque led to congressional action that created the whole levee system that protects Waterloo and Dubuque and the other river cities and now. Yeah, for several weeks in 1993, mm. I was sent back to Iowa mm -hmm. because of my familiarity with all the roads mm. because uh, it was very hard to get roads open in some locations. Mm. And I grew up in Burlington, of course, and Clinton and Dubuque and, and Des Moines. I spent time there right. uh, covering that flood, which was just remarkable when you consider there were towns along the Mississippi River that were underwater from April through July. Right. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And the city of the, <coughs> well, <coughs> let, let's, uh, let me, if I may, Jim, we need to get you to Columbus now. <laughs> uh, so, well, let's back up. And uh, um, so we're in, uh, let's see, you left Waterloo in- 1979. In 79, um, and come to this NBC affiliate where the weatherman had been snowed in his mm -hmm. own house for a week. And uh, you took over weather there. Mm -hmm. You knew quite a bit about it when you got there. Well, let's hope so. Uh, it well, seemed like know. I was able to get more equipment than I did in Iowa, mm. which helped make the job easier. And there was technology was advancing, which added more things to what I I'm sure you I got had. weather maps then when you Oh, went, yes. Right. So all that helped to make that uh, a better experience as far as more confidence in what you were doing. Right. Were you a one person? Uh, weather department then? Um, no, there was two of us at the time. Mm -hmm. Now we have four. And um, it's, I, I can't, it's just wonderful. It's just like being in Iowa, actually. Mm. Ohio is very similar to Iowa with just bigger cities. Um, how big a, Columbus has become a fairly good sized city. Hasn't 15th it? largest in the country. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing city. Well, we have yeah. Ohio State University, okay. we have the state government, sure. we have breweries, uh, so we've got a diverse thing, so we've never been in a recession mm -hmm. in that part of Ohio, like the Rust Belts and other parts, mm -hmm. and so it's been a thriving, growing place all the time. Been a very great, great community. And with my great love of snow, yeah. uh, I researched this the first 15, 20 years I was there and figured out which part of town would get the most snow every winter. And then I moved to that part of town. <laughs> and I still have an ice rink in my yard every year. Yeah. And the only thing I have, I don't even have a cell phone or uh, grill or anything like that, is I have a snowmaking machine like they have at the ski resorts. And I make 10 feet of snow in my yard in the wintertime. That's nice of you. <laughs> well, the neighbor kids love it. <laughs> so you have a snow machine yep. and, and make snow in your yard. Yep. Well, 
connect the ice rink now to that. That goes. That connects the family history, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, my dad did that for us on Nevada Street in Waterloo all the time. And come to think of it, I don't know why this never dawned on us, but when it would melt, it would flood everybody else's yard in the neighborhood. <laughs> and you think somebody would have complained at <laughs> some point, <laughs> but nobody sued or nobody complained. But yeah, he built this ice rink for us every year. And so I just continued that every year of my life, even though my kids are grown and gone. I still have neighbor kids mm -hmm. that come and play ice on my ice rink. Where do you make your snow drift? In the backyard? Yeah. <laughs> not, uh, not, on the, not in front of the house so they'd have to plow it. <laughs> uh, well, I did have one case <laughs> where uh, the New Albany police stopped by and they said, you better be careful because you're blowing snow on the interstate, which is a half a mile away. I hadn't checked out the wind. I said, this is going to look real bad if you cause an accident on a highway because you're making snow. But they were nice about oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, thought it was pretty impressive that it went that far, actually. <laughs> and doesn't that attract a crowd? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hmm. School buses pull up to my yard, things like that. But that just goes along to what... My, my whole love was back since I was 12, 13, it's been just weather. And so to be able to have my own weather in my own yard is just an extension of all that. Well, it is. Well, that brings up another point. You, uh, you be, I think you began doing personal appearances in schools and places like that when you were at Channel 7, didn't mm -hmm. you? And you still do that. Yeah, we do average about 100 appearances a year varies between women's groups, men's groups, and kids' groups. But, of course, in Waterloo, we develop uh, a senior bowling program. Oh, I forgot and to ask you And that was at that. Uh, Cadillac Lanes. And we would have up to 100 senior citizens or more fill the whole place. It was 50 lanes with senior citizens. And if they would beat me, we'd give them coffee or some simple thing like that. And uh, even the governor came, Governor Ray came to see that because it was so impressive how many people would show up for something like that. But part of the part of the shtick on that was that see if they could beat your score, wasn't it? Oh yeah. And they had handicaps and everything and there was this one lady who must have been over 90 and she had arthritis and so she had to use a ball with big holes and she was throwing every ball into the gutter. Hmm. So I got up there and to try to show her how to bowl and I'm thinking I'll throw one in the gutter just to show her that it can happen. <laughs> So I throw the ball in the gutter, and she says, what are you doing teaching me if that's all the better you are? <laughs> so I thought, okay. <laughs> and this, now you, you got on the air in 66, mm -hmm. and, and by, but again, to, to indicate the, the magnetism that television has and, and consistent appearance on the air and professionalism, you are, you are getting a lot of people watching Channel 7. Well, thanks. Uh, but well, also, we only had like three choices, didn't we? It's well, not yeah. like today. Well, no, that's true. But, uh, but, you, but up to that time, you'd get me getting your head beat in at my channel, too. Oh, yeah. All I did a show called Community Quiz. Yeah. We were opposite Marcus Welby, MD. Hmm. Talk about getting your head beat in. <laughs> <laughs> we would get like... Uh, 12 for it on that show, but it was fun. You got a picture of the community quiz? Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. You do. Wow. I almost remember those kids. Look like a salesman. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but and they, we would have to think up our questions and we made them up very similar to a Jeopardy kind of yeah. award mm -hmm. at the time. But that was on the air and attracted quite a bit of attention. Well, we had a $200 first prize. And so it went over pretty well, and teams could come back weekly. And it was a weekly honest. show. It was mm -hmm. a local production. Tuesday night, I think, at 9 o'clock. And you must have taken it on the road sometimes. Mm -hmm. We did. A, one of those pictures is, a, is from a remote location. Yeah, we did. How did they do on what? I'm, I'm not sure how they did that. <laughs> I'm sure it, was, was it couldn't have been live. Well, maybe it was. Maybe it was taped then. Maybe it was. So it couldn't you know, have been live, though. Couldn't have been live at that time. No, well, I just wow. thought, again... And you know what? I had to do all my own questions. You did your own uh, questions. Yeah, and I learned, and sometimes I'd be wrong. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the longest river in America was the Nile, they say, uh, uh, instead of the Mississippi. Uh, and you'd get that wrong, and then people would tell you about it. And I hated that uh, when I got them wrong. So you were doing the questions. Doing yourself. the questions, too. You were doing, and you were the MC. Mm -hmm. 
And what ages did, uh, and, and again, a lot of the... We had kids groups. We had old that, people. Those are pretty young kids. Yeah, these are kids here. Just barely. And I'm get trying to think. Rob Cress. Yeah, Rob. I was a background weather guy for us. He was like my Johnny Donovan. Yeah, right. The announcer who would read the questions. Right. And he, <laughs> there's some there's some pretty interesting Rob Cress. <laughs> I'm sure there anecdotes are. Anecdotes. But do you hear what happened to him? No. He moved to Detroit, WXYZ, and he was doing weather in Detroit. Mm -hmm. He was cooking in his backyard. And he got bit by a deer tick and got Lyme disease. For heaven's sake. And he was on a respirator and never could go back on the air again after that. For heaven's sake. It was just really no, sad. Cause that is a sad story. Because he was a pretty good talent. He was. Yeah, he, he was a very that. capable guy. Mm -hmm. Well, that, mm, again, that's a remarkable part of, your, of the Channel 7 experience. In addition to doing uh, 6 and 10 weather and, uh, and uh, attending college at the University of Northern Iowa, you were emceeing a weekly uh, quiz show on, on Channel 7, locally produced, mm -hmm. attracted a lot of attention. Did we have to do some local programming at the time and that's why we did it or something? I'm not sure well, what the was, reasoning was. Well, I think it was partly that, but I, I think the genius of it was this, your television, your, this television station was connecting with the audiences. You could get their kids on TV. i sure there, there was a cooking show someplace in that schedule too. And we had Romper Room, I think, too. And, and Romper Room. Uh, and you had, um, well, there was just a lot of, uh, the, the television station was providing a lot of, plus it was starting to provide a very respectable uh, news service. We had to because you were so good at WMT. Well, thank you. But it, it was maybe, well, in a sense it was true if we were that good. I, we weren't as, good, as good as we should have been to, given the circumstances. But, but in order to get competitive, and that is what, uh, again, the tr you didn't ever work for Michael for R.J. McElroy, who, uh, and the, the television station that you came into was the television station that uh, McElroy had operated, which it was a very marginal operation, and with his untimely death, a man named Bob Buckmaster took over the station, and uh, he. He was the management momentum for uh, Peterson and O'Connor and Ganahl, and you had to get through that Buckmaster gate before you got hired there. Yeah, what I, a wonderful broadcast genius, though. Yeah. And like uh, getting you was like bringing Babe Ruth to our <laughs> baseball team. Oh, you're it was like, wow. Like you're I, you're you, way out oh, of left no, field. No, 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 I'm now. serious. Continue the metaphor. Was that kind of a. But ball. Bob must. Uh, my point is that you became a uh, that station became a quality, a quality station in so many ways. You you knew people like Warren Mead. How do you remember Warren Mead? Uh, very little. Very little. Harry Slife I knew from Rath Packing Company uh -huh. when he was in after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Well, Warren was the public affairs guy, and he was the the guy who you remember the television art show over the weekend. Yes. That was his baby. Oh my gosh. I think we were the first one to even try something like well, that. We're the only one that I ever knew. And then of. to get all these fabulous paintings from people around the Iowa to come in and just, we had, uh, you know, we could have put more up than we could. Well, had well, the, room it to was show. a juried show. We hung the ones that the, uh, that no, that's not true. We, we, we hung the ones that were uh, submitted, um, and then there were awards for the, uh, uh, for prizes. Oh, they were fabulous. Yeah. That was a great day when we did that. Well, it was, it, and again, it went on for years after Warren left. I, you know, I, I inherited a lot of the things that I'm given credit for at Channel 7. I inherited from people like uh, uh, Warren Mead and beyond him, Ed Falk, who you did not know but was the first news director uh, in that organization. There, and you, you worked with some remarkable people, Jim. Bradley was oh, I know. right at the top. We were of very it. lucky. Tim Noonan, the yes. program director. You and remember. also to remember too, when you had your art show, we decided to see if that could branch out and be a part of weather. Uh -huh. And so we would have coloring contests for kids. Mm -hmm. But then it got obvious that no two-year-old could paint this picture that a 15-year-old <laughs> had to have done. Yeah. And so we weren't smart enough to know the difference, <laughs> and that went downhill in a hurry. Oh, I see. So. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you, you, you lack a little background on that. Oh, I'm uh, sure we did. Yeah. But that was the extension of your art show. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a good try. <laughs> it was. Yes. Well, uh, you've, had a, you've had a wonderful experience in Columbus, haven't you? And you're still, uh, again, let's do a little statistics here now. You mentioned the fact that uh, you, you, um, you've been in broadcasting quite a long so you are, you're 57, the ripe old age of 57. You started when you were 17, which means you've been 40 years in broadcasting at the mm -hmm. age of 57. Yeah, it helps a lot. Obviously, the goal has to be 50 years <laughs> at this point, I think. Yeah. But then we have a guy doing weather in Ohio, Dick Goddard, who's in his 80s, so out of Cleveland. So I hope that I can continue to do this as long as I want to. Well, I'm, it looks like every indication that, that you will be. Um, you have a meteorology staff of four people. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of weather. Do a lot of weather in the morning, I'm sure. Oh, way more in the morning than we do at night nowadays. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, we didn't have the morning shows. Right. Now they're like three, four hours long yeah. just to get people up and running and out the door. And so that's actually the harder job, I think. Mm -hmm. And you... Uh, you don't get as much severe weather over there as we get here in Iowa, no, but you I do mean, get some. Like last year, Iowa had more than 100 tornadoes. Mm -hmm. uh, the last four years in Ohio, we've had less than 10 each mm -hmm. year, and only mm -hmm. one this year. Mm -hmm. So it's a far more relaxing environment to do what I do than it was here. It gets to be very stressful here because storms last all night. Well, there's a lot of so, all-nighters when you were at Channel 7. Oh, yes, a lot. And you learned to do that from Conrad. <laughs> And you had to. You <laughs> had to do that. And the storms just wouldn't quiet down. And we didn't have the morning shows. So you just keep going. Yeah. And uh, right out there, everything dies down after the late news. <laughs> it's very yeah, nice. It's thing. very convenient, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a lot different than here. Yeah. Well, let's go back to what you alluded to earlier, Jim. You have your, and I, I know you're very modest about it, but um, I think it's fair to refer to you as the, as the weather god in yeah, as Conrad was the weather god in eastern Iowa, I, I think you have a similar reputation in Columbus. Well, and there's so a couple of things, like for instance, Columbus Monthly yeah. puts out a yearly annual thing on, on the best and most favored, and, and I've had that honor for two decades. I'm sure. And unfortunately, they got the most notoriety. Don't laugh. Well, I know about I, it, so go about ahead. About the tell Victoria's the Secret? <laughs> they voted me one of the 25 sexiest weathermen in the country. <laughs> I think that's a perfectly <laughs> yeah, logical. See, Stacy's over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not. She <laughs> but but uh, I said they must have added my age and my waist size together, and I won. <laughs> so. Well, so you're, you're in your later years, you're the most, this, one of the 25. You, you, didn't win at all, but no, it's a very select company. That's a very good company. Right. You also are documented as the first regular television weather caster in terms of age, right? When I was the youngest one, that's correct. 17 when I years started. old. And you are one of the youngest to win the uh, American Meteorologist Seal of Approval. Thanks to Conrad Johnson mm -hmm. at 21. Right. So Conrad a, helped you. Absolutely. He told me what to do and how to do it. And um, I wouldn't have known how to do anything like that, even though we were competitors. That says something about who Conrad sure Johnson does. was, doesn't it? Sure yeah. does. <laughs> he was and, and just, let's just, he, he was such a professional, wasn't he? Oh, the best. Hmm. And to me, um, I didn't understand how he knew as much as he did about weather. But he did. He just had an intuition for what, was going to happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And there was no comparison as far as who would be more accurate, me or him. Uh, no comparison at all. Right. He just was far better. And he had the, uh, uh, he had the distinction of being there when the uh, first use of weather radar Collins. was introduced west of the Mississippi, west, well, west of Chicago. You had Collins right in town, didn't you? Right, it was a Collins airborne radio radar scope, about five inch scope, but that would wipe those storms on. <clears throat> wow. And you could have used that. You gotta get that in your archives here, <laughs> do you? Well, we don't have the original. We have a uh, sort of a facsimile of it. It's a similar unit that uh, WMT radio bought after, uh, 
uh, after the two after the two split. When we acquired, we acquired it from a radio station in Spencer, and we thought it was the original uh, Collins, but it, it turned out it's not to. But it's very similar to it, right? So we do have something That's to represent great. it. Yeah. I'd have loved something like that. Yeah. Well, um, 1993, we had the, the terrible floods in Waterloo in the 60s and, and later in, on the Mississippi and later, I believe, in the 60s. I've kind of lost track of the timing. I think it was like 68. 68, I think. Yeah. Then uh, we'll fast forward to 93, and that old Mississippi really come, rears back on its heels. Yeah, the uh, jet stream pattern did not change spring through summer bringing every storm right down into the upper Midwest, and it was the constant battleground between the summer heat and other kinds of temperatures out of Canada, and not moving uh, put, I mean, it was uh, remarkable, because once you had so much rain, then every time the sun came out, it just evaporated what was there and fueled any other storm to come in to make it worse and just rained it back down. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to get one to two inches of rain almost daily, and you had uh, four months of that, and it was just an unbelievable pattern. All feeding into the Mississippi River shit, watershed. And you know, that Mississippi was 50 miles wide down near Keokuk and Nauvoo and Quincy, Illinois, 50 miles wide. And it was completely over the dam at Quincy, which should have been like 50 to 100 feet out of the water. It was over the top of the dam. And so it was uh, uh, just stunning to see every day when we were there. And, uh, now, and we were there. Your station then sent you with the crew to the Quad Cities to report on that terrible flood on the Mississippi. It basically for NBC, because then hmm. we would be fed back to Milwaukee, okay. Indianapolis, Los Angeles, Phoenix, whatever station So you station were feeding the network news feed as well as, okay. And the Weather Channel. And the Weather Channel. So it was, um, it was so we were everywhere hmm. over those several weeks. Were you the only meteorologist there then, or did you have some, some of you? I didn't ever see anybody else. I mean, right. So None of your, your, you were the meteorologist from your station. That's correct. Right. But you were doing, you did live feeds for your own air, didn't yes, you? Yes, we did. Yeah. But in addition to that, you fed NBC stations around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, doing reports on uh, what you were observing, you must have had some incredible stories. <laughs> well, it was just amazing how when the uh, National Guard was trying to get fresh water into Des Moines, they had to guard that area because they weren't sure if people would come and, and try to steal water because there wasn't any water, there wasn't any plumbing, and very little electricity around Des Moines for a long time. We operated out of uh, Porta Johns and just shading out of dishes and bowls and things. To well, this takes the story to Central Iowa, and there were terrible floods in Central Iowa, too, uh, which totally inundated the water system in Des Moines. That's right. So that there was no public water supply for four days, longer than that. It seemed longer than that to me, but I remember the uh, yeah, uh, it, huge, huge uh, Chinook helicopters, which were based out of Boone and Waterloo, and the National Guard units just downloading things in there to try to put back the water. As well as, uh, as hauling it in with, uh, with tanker and trucks. To make it fresh. They and had these huge... Um, yeah, lack of anything look like a swimming pool type of thing um, that would be filled with water that they would decontaminate to make fresh mm -hmm. for the people of the area too. And at Keokuk, uh, to get across from one side of the river to the other, they had a trolley track on top of the dam. And people would take a trolley that they put on the track. They laid the track on top of the dam because the bridge and the water was, was right up to that tower, that, that track. I was scared to death going over that because they had 118 gates on that dam and they were all just open wide. There were so many water moccasins everywhere, these poisonous snakes along the Mississippi River <laughs> trying to get to the high ground. Oh, sure. And you didn't know this one story down at Quincy when we were there. They were barely holding back the water and they had that bridge open. It was the only other bridge between I think, Burlington and uh, St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And this one guy was on one side of the river with his girlfriend, and he didn't want to go back to the other side of the river to, to his wife, so he sabotaged the levee. 
and the gas stations blew up and that closed that bridge for months. <laughs> just, he did that just for that reason. And he got a life sentence out of that. Uh, I, again, that is a story that I know. Stunning. Uh, How could anybody in their right mind think that's a good idea? <laughs> right. uh, it's, it's obviously. So he sabotaged, he went out and rammed it. He, he took a boat out and uh, broke the lever that the Corps of Engineers and everybody had spent so long in just building to hold that back that river yeah. so that bridge could stay open. Mm -hmm. And then when that levee broke, uh, then the water um, that had to be 10, 15 miles That wide. wall then just, and, and it closed the last bridge between. Closed the last bridge. Uh, what it would have been between from what? Iowa through central Missouri. Mm. Yeah, I guess the bridges at uh, Dubuque and uh, and Davenport were okay. Yeah. yeah, I was in Davenport too. I remember mm. that one mm. very well. Mm -hmm. The water was so contaminated that we were walking in chest deep water with our camera, and I put the camera cable in my mouth to hold it. I was sick within an hour because it was just so filled with sewage and everything else. Of course. Yeah. It was pretty nasty. So you were in it up to your into your chin, huh? <laughs> you, you were doing some pretty interesting live shots, weren't you? <laughs> we couldn't find any dry ones, so you had to use the wet ones. <laughs> you had to use the had to use the wet ones. Well, <clears throat> uh, you know this in, this is probably this is the first time you and I have seen each other face to face since that day. <laughs> You walked out the door and said, oh, I'm going that's to Columbus, sad, Ohio. Isn't it? Well, in a way it is, but I mean, that's the way the world was. But look at us today. I yeah. mean, we yeah. picked up right where we left off. Well, we did. Probably a little bit better off. Yeah. I was too scared of you back then to talk to you. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, in just as we sort of close out here, Jim, I think it's uh, you, you'd have a real tendency to, uh, to lowball your own abilities, uh, and you, you, it's okay to do that. But I think our audience would be interested in knowing that uh, in addition to all of the other, you're, you are very focused on weather, but you've applied it in a lot of different ways. And one that really interested me is that uh, you do presentations of the, uh, to organizations on the role of weather in World War II. I found that was very interesting because many of the groups that I was talking to were people who had served in the military back in World War II and the Korean War. And I would catch these tidbits of information of, oh, this typhoon affected us that day. And so I started to do quite a bit of research on that. And I had the built-in advantage that with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base nearby, uh, Paul Tibbetts, who flew the Enola Gay, with, living in Columbus. And I got to know him and talk to him and learn a lot about what he knew. Uh, the guy who bombed the bridge over the River Kwai is from Toledo, and they actually did it by plane, whereas in the movie they show it being done by the British commandos mm -hmm. on the ground. Mm -hmm. But he actually did that by a bomber in the air. And um, we found out that some of the most interesting things were that in the start of World War II, Germany had 25,000 meteorologists in the military. The U.S. and Great Britain had 50. And they were also familiar with the area that they were fighting in, mm -hmm. which was a huge advantage. And you always, if you go to the History Channel, you see these huge ships like the Bismarck, and you wonder, why didn't we bomb them ever in the ocean? Because they had meteorologists on board, and they had trees on board, and they would, had a fog machine, and they'd fog these in, stick the trees up through the fog, and we would think there was an island down there, not a ship. And the only way that you could have an effect on this ship was you had to drop a bomb right on the side of the ship below the water line. That was the only weakness these battleships had. And we could never get that kind of a target to be able to With do something like that. that kind of camouflage. That. And the Japanese knew about the jet stream. Now, we <laughs> learned about that because of our bombing runs from the islands like, like uh, uh, Wake Island and Guam, out there in the Pacific. Okinawa, places mm. like that. It was taking different amounts of fuel to fly over and back. But they knew there was this ribbon of air called the jet stream, and they launched balloon bombs toward the United States, and four of them blew up in Oregon. 
and the lesson for most people in journalism nowadays is that our media never said anything. So they didn't think they were working, and so they stopped doing it. We didn't realize that the jet stream was a factor in our weather until the 1960s, but they knew about it in the 1940s. And with World War II at uh, D-Day, there were three different areas that the, they were trying to figure out the forecast. Washington, D.C. had a group, Dunstable, England, and Widestable. Wide wide Anyhow, these three would come up with a forecast on which days to go. One guy, Sver Pedersen, which is out of Norway or Sweden, one of those two countries, knew that if we would have gone on June 5th, that the storm would have been so bad, we probably would have lost the war that day. And so he said there would be a window on June the 6th where we could do this. And everybody else didn't think that would happen, including the Germans, who sent all of their people on leave from the front there at that time, thinking the weather was going to be too harsh. And so that decision, and the reason they followed him, was because at Anzio, uh, he, he pr correctly predicted the wind direction for four straight days that you had to have for an invasion to, to work. Mm -hmm. He got that right, mm -hmm. too. So he had a huge impact as far as predicting weather and helping us win the war. Well, you've done a lot of research on that particular subject and, and in other areas, too. I oh, Halsey's Hurricanes. There's mm -hmm. books on that. Mm -hmm. He took his fleets into two different typhoons and lost his command over it. Uh, <laughs> but again, you couldn't see hurricanes then because uh, you could see them now because mm. we're in the satellites, right. but when they're off the ocean, you don't see them coming. Right. Yeah, right. Well, you, uh, you picked a pretty good career for yourself, Mr. Ganahl, didn't you? Thank you, Grant. Yeah, I, I've loved it a lot. Well, I'm sure you and, have. You know, I, and I really appreciate all the nice things you've said. You know that mm. I've had a great love for not only uh, this field, but also journalism itself and the integrity that you've taught us. And well, I try to keep that going all the time. Thank you very much. It, well, you uh, had a wonderful re reunion with your mother, who is uh, still, did you say she still lives in Dubuque? Mm -hmm. She lives in Dubuque. Okay. And uh, you've had a wonderful time up in the, in the lake country of Wisconsin with her and, and uh, several of your, uh, of your siblings. Yeah, we were able to get uh, five of us together, along with all their kids and nieces and nephews, and, and spend a week together up in northern sections there, and that's always fun. Sure nice of you to stop by and visit us, Jim Ganahl. <laughs> Thank you. How about 10, 15 years from now, we'll do the same <laughs> Let's thing. Do it. Let's do okay? it. Let's make it We have to, when it's all over with, for yeah. both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you, it won't be. <laughs> Not for you, it won't be. That's it, Stacy.